want you to take your Bibles and turn to Acts, the book of Acts, the 11th chapter. It has been my desire this day to implant in you the idea that a Christian is one who has Christ living in them. I can't be strong enough on this subject. And I am assured every time I deal with it, I've left it incomplete. I haven't the words to say really what a Christian is, but by the limited knowledge I have from the Holy Spirit. But that's growing. I learn more about what a Christian is as time goes along. To me, a Christian is not anything that you attribute Christianity today in our modern world. A Christian is someone whose life is charged, supercharged by another life that's in them. Yet we know so little how to make that work, what to do, because the Holy Spirit is the one that has the key to our understanding of really of who we are. Christians came about very strangely. From the very beginning of Christianity, there was not a clear-cut understanding given to them by the rest of the world or the rest of the Christians for that matter. Read this verse in Acts 11. And 26, it says, Then departed Barnabas to Taurus for to seek Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year, after a whole year, they assembled themselves together with the church, the rest of the body of Christ there, and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. You must realize that when Jesus went back to heaven, even before the day of Pentecost came, there were innumerable ideas about who Jesus was. You can imagine today that when some sparkling, staggering, powerful thing takes place, there are always those energetic people there who make something out of it, use it to their own end, sell something from it. Well, that happened exactly when Jesus left this earth. There were a number of groups that began. Many of them are people who followed Christ when he was on this earth. Some of them led by the apostles themselves. They were not together. When the scripture says they were all in one accord in one place on the day of Pentecost, didn't include the multitude of other people who had followed Jesus. So there were all kinds of ideas being promoted at that time. When the apostle Paul went over to Antioch, that's probably five or six years from the time he was saved. He had already discovered that there were many different ideas that the followers of Christ had. All of them probably are like today. One of them had picked out this thing to be important and this other thing important and this other thing to be important. All of them trying to get an audience. All of them trying to be heard. But when Barnabas invited Paul over to Antioch, and after a year of teaching there, it became clear that these people were Christians, that they had now been given a name as to who they were. Christians means Christ I amers. meant now that Paul's message of the mystery was incorporated into the very name of Christian. 
So when somebody tells you they're a Christian, <clears throat> what they're literally saying is that they are followers of Christ in the mystery of Christ, which is Christ in you. But of course, they don't know that. They don't understand that. Consequently, the world doesn't know what a Christian is because most Christians don't know who they are. But it becomes important while we're on this subject to talk about what is a Christian, how Christians were to come about, <coughs> what was to be their purpose and what they did. So I've jotted down seven different things. Once again, we got a number seven <clears throat> that I want to talk about this afternoon concerning what happens to people who have a revelation of Jesus Christ. What takes place? What is it that must happen in their life? Tomorrow we're going to go into Paul's life significantly to see how he made a place and room for this new understanding that he no longer lives, another lives in him. But just generally speaking about you and I, what is Christ in you produced? You see, when God looks at you, he doesn't see any other kind of believer. He doesn't see a Baptist, a Methodist, Charismatic, Pentecostal, Catholic. When he looks at anybody, he sees Jesus. You've got to understand that this is a very heartfelt thing between God and his son. That when his son paid this supreme price, a price far beyond what was needed for God to do what he had to do, but a price that was based on your sin and my sin, when he saw Jesus pay that price, he has a very heartfelt feeling for people who claim that victory that Jesus bought and paid for. And so there are several things that the Christ in you has produced that maybe you're not aware of, that you don't know about. Or maybe you do. But let's look at some of these things. Point number one, a believer who sees Christ as their life will separate, equally divide the scriptures between what God has for others and what God has for them. This first great division should be made technically between what is Israel and what is the body of Christ. They are two different groups. They are two different bodies of believers. They have two different missions. And when a believer begins to see Christ as his all, that's one thing that takes place rather automatically because Paul is very keen on that subject. Though he loves Israel, he knows that Israel is going to have to be born again. There's no way they can remain under the law and please God or themselves. And so the first important separation that's made in your thinking, and we're back to the mind again, is that Israel is a people that belong on earth who will never have Christ in them while they're on this earth. They will always have Christ outside of them as he will be Messiah, not in them, but outside of them. The other group of people are those whom God has birthed himself who never again look for Christ outside of them because they know he lives in them. That's a distinctive thing that needs to be fixed in your mind and the Holy Spirit will do that. The Holy Spirit is very keen on this business with Israel and the law that it no longer functions in behalf of those who have been rebirthed. They don't need it. People who are not rebirthed need the law. Christian people who don't know who they are in Christ need the law. They'll go to law churches. We'll get to that in a moment. They need it. Because they have no other anchor but to follow somebody's rule and regulation. But the problem is they are not earth people. And all that can do for you is give you some earthly feeling. We're a heavenly people. 
The body of Christ belongs in the Father's house. You weren't birthed to be rich, to be healthy, to be famous. You were birthed by God to be his offspring that one day will come and live in his house. Amen. Isn't that simple? That's what a Christian is. So you're not an earthling at all. And the more you tie yourself to this earth, the more problems you're going to have. I have always believed that when Christian people begin to tie themselves to the earth, they generate problems. Why? Because their structure of being birthed by God doesn't fit with trying to work things out on this earth. It just doesn't fit. What fits about you being on this earth is Christ in you. He lived on this earth. He said, I have overcome, and because I have, you shall also. But the first important thing that will happen will be a separation in your mind between others in the Scripture and who you are. Now make a note of this. That doesn't make you something greater than anybody else. Christian people who know who they are in Christ are not more important than non-Christian people. They're not more important on this earth than other Christian people who don't know Christ as their life. What makes you important is that you know your Father and your Father knows you. There's no discrepancy there. The Father knows you and you know Him. That's what it was all about. When Jesus died on the cross, the prime purpose of Him dying on the cross was to provide for the Father a family of His own. They wouldn't be Jews and they wouldn't be Gentiles. They would be His family rebirth. God would be their Father and they would be a new creation people. That's His intention. That's who you are. Now you function on this earth with a mission. We are ambassadors for Christ now. He has given to each one of us the responsibility of telling the world all around us that there is another way. There is another principle by which we should live. There is another understanding of God. He's our Father. So we're ambassadors here in a wicked erring, sinful world and we're trying to help them to see a new message. And everyone we get that sees this new message, this new understanding of God becomes an ambassador too. <coughs> Being a soul winner is good. He that wins a souls is wise. But you can be a soul winner to your own advantage but you can never be an ambassador for Christ for your own advantage. Because when you start making yourself somebody, yourself getting rich, let's think about ambassadors, they get rich, they begin to promote their own thing and stop living under the shield of their government, they're out of order and they'll get called home. I must tell you, I think a lot of God's children get called home because they get out of order. Because they, they are basically ambassadors on this earth. You see, there's a whole story there that we need to look into sometime. But Paul was very clear on that because he gives the Christian commission, the born-again believer's commission, is found in that fifth chapter of 2 Corinthians. That's where he says we're ambassadors for Christ. So there are certain things you get separated in your mind as to who you are. Most of us are taken up with the idea, well, I am a family member. I am a dad. I'm a mom. I'm a child. We get taken up with that, that that's the greatest thing in the world. That's all right to an extent, but if you dismiss the fact of who you are to God your Father then these other things will have a hard time coming together. It's God first. It's our Father first. When He's first, then all these subservient things and satellite things in our life kind of flow all right. 
But the first thing you do is get separated as to who you are. You are a birth child of God. To the world, you may not look like it, act like it, and to yourself, you may not feel like it very much. But that's who you are. And so you're here to represent your heavenly government. You are never here to straighten out this earth. You are not called to straighten out the world. That's why Jesus had the remarks he did in the Lord's Prayer when he spoke of the world so many times. He even said in one place in that prayer that, Father, I know it's hard on these that are left here on the earth and I pray for them. I don't ask you to take them out of the world now, but I pray for them because they have a hard mission. That is if Christ is our life. Did you know there are enough Christians on this earth that if they were to live a biblical life and have an understanding who they were in Christ, that they would actually change this world? Sure would do it. We had an election in America this last year that showed what Christians could do when they got riled up over something. They could do it. They all went to to the polls to vote and made a real impression upon the world there. Now the world doesn't know how to handle Christians. America didn't know they had Christians who'd do something. Christians have power, but they're so divided they have no power because Christ is alive. Christ is the power. So you need to get fixed in your mind that there are certain things you need to separate yourself from. Certain things that hinder you from being who you are. You're an ambassador for Christ. You are not something else. Your mission is to reconcile people to God. That is, bring them to Christ. That's what your mission is. And in this chapter in Corinthians, fifth chapter, am I right on that? In this fifth chapter, he says that the only gift God gives the born again is the gift of reconciliation. I mean, every, every sinner saved gets the gift of res- reconciliation. And you know why that's important? Because that belongs to the ambassador. His mission is to reconcile people, reconcile them to God. That's what we're to be doing on this earth, is reconciling people to God. A soul winner is a great thing, but a soul winner can be in his own mission. An ambassador is always in the mission of his government. That's the difference. I'm under that government and proud of it. I'm glad I got somebody over me. Somebody asked me the other day, have you got any covering over you? Got the whole government of God. I'm just a lowly ambassador, but I'm part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I've been translated into the kingdom of Jesus Christ, and I'm happy about it. That's what a Christian is. He's one who makes these separations in his mind as to who he is. Point number two. A Christian knows that the sin nature is killed at the cross. Now, theology is not going to let that happen. I have spent much of my life concerned about why it is that all sin is not killed out of the human by Jesus on the cross. You twist scriptures around, you come up with different things. But I believe that Christ died for all sin and that all sin is put under by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that means our sin nature. What is our sin nature? That's the nature of Adam and Satan that came together in the Garden of Eden and was passed on to the human race so that David could say on one occasion that a mother who brings forth a child brings forth that child in sin. Well, that's a very known thing in the Scriptures. There is a sin nature. But when you accept that Jesus is your Savior... I believe that all sin went out. Yet the church world says 
Why do Christians still do bad things? I went through this once before in this meeting. They do it because they got a mind problem. They have not in their minds had a renewal. They've not been renewed in the spirit of their mind. How do you get spirit renewal in your mind? From the preaching of the gospel. Romans 16, 25, when that gospel is preached to you regularly, that's the renewal of the mind. Your mind will get renewed. So don't sit in a place that doesn't preach it if you want to go on with God. I must tell you that most Christians I know in the world today don't want to go on with God. They don't want to. I had a lady that came into one of our meetings not long ago. She said, I'll never listen to this again. I don't want to get mixed up anymore. I looked at her and I said, too late. <laughs> too late. I didn't bring you another cult message. I brought you the message right out of the scripture from the only man that knows about you. You're going to have to handle it one way or another. And you know that happens. I've been in this thing a long time and people come back to meetings every once in a while and I thought we're gone. Never see them again. But you know they're hooked. They're hooked. Once caught, no escape. Once caught, no escape. Sin nature. You don't have a nature of sin. The only nature you have is a God nature. You don't have another nature. You have only one nature. You don't have a human nature. You never had a human nature. That's a creation by psychologists, I guess. There is no such thing as a human nature. Nowhere in the Bible is it mentioned. And I'm strict on that. Because if you've got a human nature and a God nature, they're at war with each other. And that's not what Christianity is. You've got a human mind. You mustn't let that mind become a nature. It thinks and creates by the thinking somebody, maybe not the real you, but creates somebody like you. So the sin nature is out. It was killed at the cross. A believer may sin at times, but this comes from an unrenewed mind. Always remember that. Put that in your notes. When a believer sins, it comes from an unrenewed mind. He thinks wrong. He got in a spot and he thought wrong. He forgot who he was. He forgot he had been rebirthed. Many Christians commit sin and don't know these things. But those who know it have their forgetter working better than their rememberer. Look at some scripture with me on this point. Turn with me to 1 John. First John chapter 1. Verse 7, you know it by heart. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin but the sin nature. Is that okay with you? Nobody said anything. Cleanses us from all sin. All sin. <clears throat> Let's mark 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We talked about it. Let's, let's mark it. <clears throat> Verse 17. One of the most popular verses in the Bible. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. A good way to read that verse is, Therefore, if any man knows, 
He is in Christ. He is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. There's no sin nature left in that, you see. He's a new creation. Can you be a new creation and have part of the old life trailing behind? No, sir. It's gone. What you have is a mind that's out of order. And your mind is out of order if you haven't heard Paul's message. If you haven't heard Paul's gospel, it's out of order. Because God is going to judge people according to Paul's message. Are you ready for that? He's not going to judge you according to Moses. He's not going to judge you according to David's Psalms. He's not going to charge, establish you according to Isaiah. God is going to establish you according to Paul's gospel. So you need to know it. Somebody said, well, uh, just read that all the time. Yeah, get read it until you find out who you are. <clears throat> you say, you mean just read nothing but Paul's epistles? That's right. Read them until you know who you are. Because that's the only place in the Bible you're going to find that out. So stay there until you find it out. Then you can go anywhere in the Bible and be blessed by it. It's God's Word. But until you get fixed in your mind who you are, it makes a lot of difference where you study in the Bible, God's Word. All of God's Word is for you. But the only place in the Scriptures that says something to the born again comes out of Paul's epistles, some of the other epistles in John's Gospel, nowhere else. Just that simple. <coughs> Number three, the ongoing believer knows that there is only one baptism. That is for him. Now, a lot of people have different baptisms. I ran into a man the other day that said our church has four different baptisms. I didn't even ask him what they were. I also ran into a fellow not long ago who said he had joined several different churches and he had been baptized in water nine times. <laughs> in Ephesians 4 and 5, Paul says there is one baptism. <clears throat> I believe any ongoing believer will come to that. What is the one baptism? 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, where you are placed in Christ. By the Holy Spirit, you are baptized, placed in Christ. It has nothing to do with water. The word baptized means complete immersion. When you were saved, you were completely immersed into Christ. That's the body you're in, the church you're in. The reason I can't ask you to join something here is because you're already in the perfect body. Can't offer you anything better than you already got. And if I offer you something, it'll only demoralize what you already have. One baptism. I won't argue over baptisms, but I follow Paul on this account. I have baptized hundreds of people in my lifetime. As a pastor, I baptized people every week because we had a big church until I couldn't baptize them anymore. I baptized all kinds of people. I baptized people that I thought they were going to die before I got them out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> I baptized several people that I had to sit down on to get them all the way immersed. I literally Sit down on them. I've had a great experience with water baptism. But when I decided to follow Paul, I heard Paul say, I baptized a few, but no more. Why did he say that? Because the one baptism should have covered that. Because the one baptism has you in Christ and Christ in you. It doesn't have you outside of the church and needing the church to do something to bring you inside. Doesn't need that. You don't like that, just throw that part out. 
But an ongoing believer is going to deal with these sort of things. Going to deal with them. <clears throat> what is an ongoing believer? That's a term I'll use lots of times. That's a believer who can't be stopped in his growth. They're going on. They're going on. An ongoing believer will be in a box a few times because he's looking for more truth that will satisfy him. You get in a box of religion. You ever been in a box of religion? You're boxed in. You're told, believe this to be one of us, and if you don't believe this to be one of us, you won't be one of us. Boxed in. The only way you can get out of that box is to jump out of it. Or there's another way you can be kicked out of it. But the ongoing believer is not going to stop. He's going to keep on going. Now to some believers that becomes hard work. That's regretful because they don't have a good message to go with what they're doing. They don't have a good gospel. Because I have found this search for the fullness of Christ in my mind the greatest adventure I've ever been on. It is more thrilling than anything I've ever done. Because every once in a while on this journey I'm on, I keep on going, this journey I'm on has something to open up to me that I never dreamt of before. Right out of the Scriptures. Something I never saw before. I had it just to open up to me. There was a time I, I taught epistles on a college level. And you'd, you know, you'd think you knew, I knew the next verse that come after the verse. Knew, knew, knew what it said. If, if I didn't have it in memory, I could, I could say, well, that verse is there somewhere. I taught that, but I didn't have the slightest idea what it meant. I knew it, but I didn't know the Christ that had to do with it. That's the difference, you see. Learning this Christ that has to do with these scriptures. I don't read these scriptures to be smart historically. I read the scriptures and study them because that has to do with the Christ that's in me. You see, when I became a Christian, I had no background as a Christian. If God is my father, I'm not like an Israelite who have Abraham for a, a father. Every Jew can quote his history. He's got it written here in the Bible. His history goes all the way back to Abraham and even before. He can talk about how they, Abraham got to be Abraham. He has a history. When I became a born-again believer, I had no history outside of God being my Father and His Son being my life. So you know what I've had to do? I've had to take into my life that history. That's my history now. I'm in the family. I had to take on the God history. Like when I have eternal life in me, it not only is eternal future, it's eternal past. My life goes all the way back to eternal past. My history is in God. And then when Jesus comes to this earth, that's a part of my history. But when Christ comes to live in me as a new creation... That's my life. That's my life. So I don't have Abraham in my history. I don't have Moses in my history. My history is all in the Father and His Son, which would make Paul say, or John say, our fellowship is with the Father and His dear Son. Oh, you wasn't ready for that, was you? Because we all got our earthly history. But ultimately your history is in your Father. 
Think of it. An ongoing believer will be ready for that. Point number four. A Christian taught by the Holy Spirit will learn the difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Religion as it stands now has made them both the same. And there are places where both the same are so mentioned as such in the Scriptures. In fact, one place mentions the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, and the Holy Spirit all in the same sentence. So that's a part of your history. You have the whole family involved in you. As Jews can say they're the seed of Abraham, we are the seed of our Heavenly Father, and that takes in everything that has to do with the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, as well as God the Father. That's what we are. But you need to separate the Holy Spirit from the Spirit of Christ. It is my personal feeling that the Spirit of Christ is not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit can never give me what comes from Christ. The Holy Spirit didn't die for me. The Holy Spirit is not my Savior. The Holy Spirit is not my healer. The Holy Spirit is not my soon coming Lord. But the Holy Spirit is equally important because He's that part of God that wants us to know. When this council of Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost drew up this plan, the obligation given to the Holy Spirit was to tell people what it was God was doing. So Jesus said when He comes to this earth, He'll not speak of Himself. He'll speak only of me. That's His mission. So the Holy Spirit has a distinctive mission. He's not our life. He's not the Spirit that gives us life, and He's not the Spirit that is our life. He's the Holy Spirit that functions in our doings, in our daily walk. He works in our mind. He works to teach us, to instruct us, to guide us, to help us along. That's His mission. So as you face the issue of what is a Christian, a Christian is one who knows the difference between the Spirit of Christ and the Holy Spirit. Paul would say in Romans 8 and 9 that any man that did not have the Spirit of Christ was none of his. Now, theologians interpret that verse to mean the Holy Spirit. But I am never one who belongs to the Holy Spirit. I belong to Christ. He is my life. You understand the difference there? He is our life. The Holy Spirit teaches me that life. He is given to me as a comforter, a guide, a paraclete, one who walks alongside me. He's with me in my daily walk. Christ is my life, permanent. The Holy Spirit is the doer. He's the doer. Christ is the beer. In you, Christ is the beer. Not beer. A lady said one time, why would you call Christ beer? I said, please hyphenate the word. He's our beer. The Holy Spirit is our doer. Hyphenated. Doer. Number five, <clears throat> an ongoing believer will learn that he died at the cross and ever since he was saved, his old life is dead. We will see as we get over into Philippians 3 further now that you have no life of your own. You were not intended to have your own life. That's why you needed a Savior. You couldn't save yourself. You were never intended to have a life of your own. Our world is so messed up today that the most criminal thing taking place in our world today 
is among women who abort little babies. Why is that the most criminal thing? Because they think they have their own life. Anybody that thinks they have their own life and does nothing but protect themselves in a selfish way is not an ongoing believer. I say this to you very personally, that an ongoing believer, a believer who knows that Christ lives in them, will realize they died to their self-interest, to their self-life, to their self-indulgent. They're dead to it on God's part. <clears throat> Sometimes people come to me and say, well, I have this problem, and uh, I really thought this is what I ought to do. This is what my life was all about. But the Lord didn't, didn't help me there. My answer to them was very simple. When you selfishly deal with God, He will unselfishly consider your problem like as if you didn't have it. Have you ever prayed a prayer and wonder why God didn't do something about it? It was a good prayer. You had a great need. Why didn't He do something about it? There are probably a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is He would say you, you pray wrong. You don't pray as one of my children. The second reason is you already have that if you knew it. Why should I keep giving you things I've already given you? Listen sometimes. The Holy Spirit's going to say that to you. Something you desperately need and want. We have so idolized people's prayer life that we got them praying for everything that comes along. Forgetting what was bought at the cross. Forgetting what happened when you were born again and God dumped the bucket of grace on you. Forgetting all that's happened. We selfishly go about saying, God, if you don't do this, you're just not God anymore. That's why I'm on the subject of the renewal of the mind. Get your mind straightened out to know who you are and what you are in Christ Jesus. A couple more things and I'll quit. Number six, the believer who is in Christ with knowledge, will learn that the seed in him is incorruptible, that he has been rebirthed by a new father, and he will pick up life differently. He'll study to know life. Now, I have this point in there because I get kind of confused with human beings. I see a human being that will sit at a computer Day and night till they learn it. Learn what they want to know about it. I've seen families break up over the computer. I've seen kids get in a mess of trouble over their computer. And I'm not saying that you ought to stop the computer. But I'm using that as an example. That I find very few people who will take the word of God. Like Peter 1.23 that says that you have an incorruptible seed in you. I find very few people that will take that and do anything with it. We'll live on a computer day and night. But here is a verse of Scripture that says you have a God seed in you, that God cohabitated with you in an act of love and placed His seed in you. I don't find many books written on that subject. I don't find many people talking about it. If they are, I missed them somewhere. But an ongoing believer, a Christian, is going to find out about that seed, what it means, attach to it everything that Paul attaches to it that is yours in Christ. I found over 100 things that happened to a sinner when he was saved that most believers never come to the knowledge of. But the Scripture says they are his. That's what happened to you. One more thing. Number seven. A Christian is going to move from faith to faith. A little verse of Scripture says something about that. But what you're going to do is move actually from your faith to his faith. That's what Christianity is all about. Moving from your faith aspect of life 
to His. You're going to move from that. And a good place to consider it is in faith. This, this, this straightened me out once and for all about faith because I used to teach on faith all the time. I've even written books on it. I hope you never get a hold of one. <laughs> <clears throat> but the believer moves from his faith to the faith of Christ. You need a King James for this, but I'll give you the scripture, some of the scriptures that will help you because my time has passed. I'm already into the supper time now. Romans 3.22 Galatians 2.16 and 20 Galatians 3.22 Philippians 3 and 9 All of these verses say that it is the faith of the Son of God. How could you muster faith to get things from God when Christ within you is your life, your intercessor, your total everything, but on the side you want your own faith instead of trusting the faith of the Son of God? It's a whole new world, believers. It's a whole new world. Paul brings us into a whole new and different understanding of what a Christian is. He doesn't tie Jesus of Nazareth to it. He doesn't tie the Old Testament to us. He doesn't talk about Moses. He doesn't talk about David. The only things he talks about out of the Old Testament are the things that concern the Jews who sit in his meeting who are wanting to know what their relationship is with Christ. He no longer even knows Christ in the flesh. He has moved on to a new and different world, a different understanding. It's all written there plainly. I encourage you to study it, to seek after it. You'll even find in these verses I gave you that the faith you had to accept Jesus was given to you by God. But under the law, you had to have faith. In the kingdom message, you have to have faith. Jesus says if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you can move mountains and whatever. But that's different. That's a different world there. We're now in a world on this earth where Christ is life. And we are his offspring. Enough said day is over. Would you stand please? I hope you have a new respect for your neighbor there. Look at that person on either side of you. They got Jesus living in them. A very personal Christ to them. He lives in them. I want you to know that more than any other one thing. That's what happened to you when you were saved. Well, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you. In your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me, in my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in me. That's it. Hug every neck you can. God love you.